Awesome. Too. That sounds terrific. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Sudholm. I'm with the Prince Life Conservation Alliance, and I'll be your moderator today. And we are at the last breakout session. And today we are talking about native edibles and medicinal plants, which I'm going to And um, thank you all for sticking around with us. And I think this has been a really great program. And this is a really great way to wrap things up and, and really put some of the knowledge that you've been learning all throughout today into, into action and even like use some of the plants that, that we're planting. So, Clay Morris uh, has served as an environmental pro in the environmental program at uh, Prince William County for over 12 years. He has an associate's degree in horticulture and natural resource management, a bachelor's in environmental studies from Shenandoah University, and a master's in biology from University of North Carolina, Wilmington, with interest in ethnobotany, agroecology, and early culture. He started Forgotten Foods Gastronomy as a platform for teaching about foraging, ethnogastronomy, and permaculture. So we are in for a treat today. And Clay, thank you so much for introducing us to so many awesome plants that will be growing right now in our backyards and we can encourage to grow more of. Thank you. My pleasure. And I did this last, Ashley's my moderator today, and I do want to give a plug to Ashley and Jessica and all the other people that you see okay. here today. I don't know if you're familiar with this native plant symposium. This started five years ago. Julie Flanagan and I, Supervisor Anderson, I saw that that little short video, Supervisor Anderson, Ruth Anderson that time, gave us that and said, why don't we do something? So our first Native Plant Symposium five years ago was limited to 100 people. So we had a 40 county supervisor. Today we have over 400 people. So both virtually and in person, an amazing lunch. So um, the wonderful thing is having it, um, I always say hire millennials, hire young people. It's been lovely to hand off all this technology and stuff to people like Ashley, because um, uh, I'm, I'm just here barely working with Clay. So, um, so my name is Clay Morris. So remember my name is very down to earth name. And today we are going to talk about um, we background uh, in the environmental program at Prince William County. And uh, on TV, I play a forager, a gardener. I am a consummate thing. I love food. And I'm interested in ethnobotany, ethnoecology, ethnogastronomy. Ethno means tribe, race. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in how they use plants. I'm interested in how they eat them. And so uh, food culture is really my, is my passion. I'm really fascinated and we've lost a lot of food. And the reason I'm really interested in food is to get that great commonality. I can sit down with somebody I know nothing about. If I share a plate of food with them, I'm going to understand a bit of that. And it is a great link to various cultures. I did start Forgotten Foods Gastronomy. I started that last couple of um, a couple of months. Um, eventually, I'll have a website and stuff. But it is my platform. It's my platform to teach and talk about these foods that we're losing. I work within three contexts: Native American, Appalachian, and Southern food. So I'm a little bit of all of that. One model that I'm interested in is transformational learning. So there's transformational learning, there's transformational teaching. And that is, um, we're not going to, I don't want to go too deep down in this, but when you get out of high school, you start going to college, in high school, you're taught, especially us Westerners, we're kind of taught these ways of thinking about history and science. And then all of a sudden, in, especially in ecology and some of the crises that we're having environmentally, you're going, mm, all those things that they told me aren't quite working out for us, and we need to rethink things. So this doesn't have to just be ecology. Um, transformation learning can apply for anything, but it is, it, it's, it is allowing yourself to go, mm, the way I'm thinking about something, so today you're here at native plants and stuff. You are like, what, what's native plants? What's that going to fix? What's that going to do? You're starting to question and realize that there are issues and problems. And um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just want you to understand the goal of today is to kind of get you to rethink about your landscape. All of you here today excited about plants, but let's think about the plants that we're doing and how they can actually fix some of the problems and issues we're having. Okay. 
Would it be annoying to use this? Oh, okay. Or just so the people in oh, online okay. can hear? Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Yeah. I'm not gonna hold it because I'm one of those. Then. Yeah, um, I know. You have to. <laughs> okay, so why forage? We always have, as a species, as Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, everything we've ever been, we've always foraged. It's always been part of us as a species, and it supplements our appetite. You know, we can't eat meat all the time. Actually, vegetables and uh, wild foods were probably more readily available than there was wild game. There's something called traditional ecological knowledge, and that's kind of my whole approach to things. Is that there are there are indigenous peoples that have been using plants for thousands of years, and there is something to be said for us to understand how they did it, how they use it, and to keep hold of those things. So a lot of my uh, approach to that is trying to hold on to that knowledge, to share that knowledge. And so today, a lot of the discussion is going to be kind of along that. We are going to talk about some forage plants, but it is not going to be this exhaustive list of here's 100 plants. Because what I think is more important is that we understand the context for them. Foraging, we do it for health. It's good for us. Uh, seasonal diet. There are right now there are green plants out there that you can be eating, and there has been a lot of uh, evidence in terms of like our intestinal biome. They look at indigenous or they look at people that have a very heavy foraged um, diet. They look at their intestinal gastrobiome and their uh, biome, and they realize that, you know what these people don't have? They don't have most of the Western diseases that we're suffering from because the biome, your intestinal biome is very important in terms of regulating their health. So um, let's start getting some of those foods. There is over 4,000 edible plants in the U.S. alone. Now with my foraging classes, I do remind people that edible does not mean palatable. <laughs> Okay, there's some bitter things, there's some nasty things out there, but you know they'll get you through. What I also like to do is I will take those not those less palatable things, move them over into the modern cuisine, and actually make them more palatable. And that's a whole movement that's going on in the restaurant industry right now. So let's rewild our diet. Let's you know reconnect with nature and history and culture. There is such a wide variety of plants out there that have these wonderful stories and. Um, Let's let's get those back. When I was growing up, so I grew up in um, in West Texas, and I was among Mescalero Apaches and Taos Indians, and so I grew up with them. And then I moved to um, West Virginia, Jefferson County, West Virginia, and and so in in Texas, my nannies were either Native Americans or or Mexicans, and so I was learning their food cultures. When I moved to West Virginia. Had this lovely black lady, Miss Martha Payton. She was my nanny. She would take me out and we would go picking greens. She taught me all these foods and it was just such a part of the culture. But then I noticed over the years, nobody does that. Nobody's going out there gleaning fields and looking for this stuff. And it, within my, I'm not going to say old range, but within a, you know 30 to 40 years, this access to all these foods is now gone. And it's a shame because there's a lot of food out there. So it gets to the whole issue of food security, COVID. Where'd all the vegetables go? You know, you go into the grocery store and all of a sudden there was no greens, but there's tons of, tons of, tons of greens out there. There's plenty of healthy food out there, but where did it all go? Because our food security, our food supply system is so reliant upon this model of shipping things in from everywhere. But I can go out my back door and I can make a salad. Um, broaden our horizons, you know, broaden our palate, try new things. And it's just fun and creative. So it's also a cultural thing. And, and Japanese have a rule called sensei. And the word just means being good to eat. And they noticed all these things starting coming up. Anybody reckon? Oops, I knew I was. Oh, me and, uh, well, I went there. Okay. Anybody recognize that plant? Hosta. You know, hostas are edible. Yep. Japan, they're a common green. For us, it's a thing we try to keep deer eating from our yards, and they're real pretty. We never eat them. But that is a very common green in Japan. And so they had these, these early spring vegetables. They noticed that all these things just started coming up. The Greeks had the same thing, horta. They had a word 
for all these edible green things, horta, horticulture. I mean, there were the, they, there were all these plants coming up. They were free and they were readily accessible. The Italians, Piante Spontanea and Erbe Salvice, spontaneous plant. What a great name for this weed that Paul, we don't call it weed, we call it Piante Spontanea. You know, that's so much more pleasant than weed and it has, it has meaning to you. It, there is a soup called Guido Verce, which is widow soup. And it's kind of sad, but basically it was a widow. She didn't have a man anymore. She had no money. She could go out and she could find enough wild things growing that she could make a soup to sustain her. Um, Latins, carites, you know, this is a, there, a lot of cultures have a foraging background and we should embrace it. So one of my specialties is Appalachia. Uh, we're not that far from Appalachia. I grew up in Appalachia. 345 edible plant species and 77 families. One of the most biodiverse regions in the world. There's 10 great biodiverse regions. Appalachian Mountains is one of them. There's also something called agrobiodiversity. And agrobiodiversity means that the people have combined the foraged foods that they have along with their farming practices. And so they have this agrobiodiversity. Now, something to remember about the why foraging was so important is because of the before the advent of, of canned foods and frozen foods and growing at the grocery store, everything that you ate had either been cured, smoked, dried. So come springtime, did your grandmother ever tell you eat your greens? I had an English grandmother. It was bitter. Bitter was medicine. And the reason was, is yeah, all year long, all winter long, everything, you had not had a green vegetable. So your liver was screaming. So springtime, they're starting to pop up now. There's all these little green things that are coming up that you eat because they're good for you. They're deobstruents. They make your liver function. And the whole importance of greens, it, you know, was for that health. There is a word called salad. You ever heard of poke salad? S-A-L-A-T. So salad is an old term. Basically, anything was a, was a saute. You take whatever green you found, saute it, and that was salad. Anybody seen pokeweed? Okay. Is pokeweed edible? It's edible. It's edible when it's really young. And most of the time, so when it's like at this stage, and I call it the forager's pufferfish, because, you know, you get it wrong. It's delicious if you get it wrong, and it's really not good for you if you get it bad. So, uh, you know, this is it when it's edible, and this was a delicacy. This saute was some bacon grease, and you were eating good, but you had to cook it right. Once it got this big, then you were seeing God, and, you know, it was not such a great day. I always wondered who figured this out. <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, okay. So what happened? Um, we had this, as a nation, as a people, we've had this long, long history of eating foraged foods. And then um, slowly that knowledge got lost. We kind of kicked the Indians out and the settlers started adopting uh, more traditional ways of thinking. And so the Great Depression came. There was plenty of food. We see the depression as everybody's starving. No, there was plenty of food, just nobody could afford it. And so what the government did was they came in and they, um, so farmers were going out of business. So they created the very first farm bill. And what the farm bill did was it gave subsidies to farmers to not grow food. And that helped stabilize the price. I'm still not sure what that did about people not being able to afford it. But farming declined. Farmers were still going out. And then you also had the great migration. So particularly for black people in the South, the black farmers and the sharecroppers started moving North. So farming was dying and started eating canned foods. So we didn't really have to grow our own food. We could go to the store and our food was there and it was canned and it might've been a dubious quality, it was not fresh. Then World War II comes along, the Victory Gardens. Oh, and you know, oh, I'm being unpatriotic. The Victory Gardens, and you can even see just in the imagery that existed was, oh man, she is just, she's just blasting that bug and with this, probably DDT or some other horrible chemical, but we kind of started getting this sort of factory mindset and sort of very mechanistic way of growing food. And so, um, you know, factory is metaphor, exactly. All these lovely fertilizers and pesticides, therefore all of a sudden we were just growing food like crazy and 
Um, then we had these machines that could harvest stuff. And man, we had so much food that it overwhelmed the food supply. So even though subsidies didn't help anything. So all of a sudden in the 1970s, a fellow by the name of Earl Butts, uh, Secretary of Ag at that time said, forget this small farm. We're going to pump all of our federal subsidies into the big farms. So welcome to ConAgra and welcome to these massive. So we as a people kind of lost, we even kind of gave up willingly our ability and our willingness to grow our own food because somebody else is going to grow, of course. So um, all of a sudden, though, you've got ConAgra, they're pumping out all this food, this pesticide laden, and everything else, and it's poor quality, and they're marketing it, and they're packing it to us, and they're selling it to us as Hot Pockets and everything else, but they made it convenient for us. And two generations later, we have all kinds of healthy um, health-related illnesses. Oh, did I love that DDT, like chloral diphenyl trichloroethane? And that just, you know, DDT is good for me. <laughs> uh, so what I'm proposing is we have to get back to ecological system thinking. And the reason to do that is I had mentioned that we had sort of shifted away from the indigenous way of thinking and growing and doing things. And we started adopting sort of this Western mindset. So the Renaissance and the Enlightenment gave us with all these notions of I'm going to study this thing and I'm going to I'm going to separate this thing and I'm going to know this thing. And, and then all of a sudden, things like microscopes and chemical analysis, we started taking one thing and we started breaking it apart so that we could understand it. The problem that we did, though, was we lost the connection. We didn't realize how that we understood everything about that one thing, but we lost the connection and that interrelatedness that it had to it. And that is the real problem that um, kind of carried us through with it doesn't matter if the soil is good or bad, I can put a fertilizer in it. It doesn't matter if these bugs and things, I can spray it, I can create the sterile and I can manipulate my environment. But now that environment is failing us. And so we've got to get back to this whole, whole systems thinking. I'm sure all of us in school have seen the famous food web. You know, it talks about the producers, the primary producers and the secondaries and the third and, you know, the cat ate the rat and that whole thing. Um, so we do need to kind of get back to that. What we're going to talk about today in terms of food is creating a sort of a, a system that allows that. Things you have to have, those you have to have space and you have to have time. And so we're going to talk about structure and we're going to talk about succession of what I'm going to encourage you, what I want you to think about today is actually creating a healthy, we're going to talk about something called a food forest, so that you can do your own foraging on your own property. You ever heard of permaculture? So permaculture is a, is, a, is a gardening system, and it kind of plays off on trying to recreate this notion of creating a healthy growing environment, gardening environment. Comes from the word oikos, house, a place to be. Of course, ecology, study of things, organisms, their surroundings, uh, relationships between living things. There's a lot today about relationships. That's really important. An ecosystem is an area in which all living things and non-living things form an interacting or an interacting system. So, what we're going to talk about is creating a food forest in which we're actually going to create our own little ecosystem. And there's basic tenets of it: uh, dependence of energy flows things coming in and out of that system. There's solar, of course, um, you know, it's really kind of important. Uh, we make sure that energy is used efficiently. So we're not gonna be talking about fertilizers and pesticides. We're gonna talk about putting things that will preclude us from even needing to consider fertilizers and, and pesticides. And remember the energy cannot be controlled or destroyed, but you can transform it, you can store it, you can use it within your system. So as we get into this, it'll be a bit more, it'll make a bit more sense. Permaculture is a way of living. Permaculture is a huge field. We couldn't possibly talk on all the different topics, but really what we want to just talk about today is how to think about our landscape. So it encourages the restoration and the balance in our environment. And we're going to do that through thinking about like thinking like an ecologist. It provides a philosophy of cooperation with nature and each other, as opposed to I'm going to make nature, I'm going to make this plant grow, I'm going to make this thing, uh, I'm going to put what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to put this plant here because this plant belongs here and kind of think about it that way. Focus on design. It's a conscious process of placement and planning developments, objects and processes in relation to each other. So you're going to spend some time in your 
the on, in your property, and you're going to understand it. You're going to spend a year on your property looking at it, figuring out what's going on. How many, if you were to walk out on the property and I said, where does the rough sunrise? You might be able to, where does the sun rise in the summer versus the summertime or the wintertime? Might not know that so much. Where does the wind blow? Where does the water go? So we're going to talk about understanding your property so that you can work with as an ecosystem. And you can do it at any scale. You can do it in a townhouse to 100 acres. It is scalable. So what we're looking for in permaculture and in terms of landscape designs, we look for patterns. Where's the sun go? Where's the moon rise? You know, where's that going on throughout? Where are the shadows throughout there? Where's the rainfall? And we're going to understand uh, our property. It all boils down to an understanding of the basic underlying of patterns and natural phenomena as an essential tool for design and harmonious living. Oftentimes we think, we look at our landscape, oh, I want to put this plant there. The plant might not want to be there. It might not grow there because you've not thought about the conditions that are there. It's just, I want, and that doesn't work. A better understanding of your property is going to help you to, uh, to do that. So there is a process, I'm going to do an assessment. So this, you know, this year, go out there, take a look at your property. The, it's the who, what, whens, and wheres, and hows. Uh, data collection, observation, record keeping, looking and observing, understanding your property. Then you're going to come up with a vision plan. What do I want? This is where you get to go nuts. You know, go big. Uh, the next step is the concept plan. That's when we come back to reality. Because Wow, that sounds expensive. Or that might be hard. Or that's going to take a while. So, you know, give yourself room to breathe, but it's fine to have a vision. But that vision has to be understand on your understanding of property. And then an action plan. Five years. The, word, the biggest mistake is to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff and plant it in the ground. You're going to go broke. Because um, if you don't understand, you're going to plant the wrong stuff in the wrong place. It's, it's just not going to work. And plants are expensive. So here's what an assessment of your property would look like. And here's your house. And you and then look at some of the things they're noting. Like, there's, there's a low area here, and your shade over here. And, you know, this is just noting what's going on in your property. You'll go out in the sun and the wind and the rain and everything, and you're going to kind of keep a notion of what's going on in your, in your, in your area. So now we're going to jump into poly, um, permaculture is a huge thing, uh, but one of the really important things is called polyculture gardening. Who's ever heard of Three Sisters? Three Sisters is a gardening, is an indigenous gardening in which you grow a corn, a squash, and a bean. Why? Because I like corn and I like squash and I like beans. Why am I growing them together? Well, the corn grows up, it gives a trellis for the bean to grow up. The bean is leguminous, so it is fixing nitrogen. So it is pumping nitrogen into the ground. I'm growing squash. Squash is then shading the ground and maintaining the moisture. So there is this relationship between these three things. I work with the Pamunkey Nation. They have a, um, there's a reservation in King William County and I'm working with them to kind of recreate their food waste. And one of the funniest stories that was told to me was, so anybody heard Pocahontas? Pocahontas was Pamunkey. So when the English first came to this area, they wanted the they wanted the natives to grow things. And the thing that drove, but what they wanted is they wanted fields of wheat and they wanted fields of corn. But the Pamunkey would, well, I have this useful weed, so I'm going to keep this weed here. And oh, I have space here, so I'm going to grow some corn here. And yeah, I'll plant some beans over there. But and it drove the English crazy, but the Pamunkey knew that. Why would I get rid of this food? Why would I get rid of this wild food? It's food. Why would I get rid of that? And I'll grow that here. And they also understood that as a strategy, you don't grow one of everything. Your enemy comes along and wipes you out. So, and for a long time, you know, even the, even in Appalachia, you know, there's a corn and there's some squash and, you know, they still kind of had that idea of just growing things, no yard, none of this. They were just, you don't, you donate, you devoted your land to making food. So today we're going to talk about agroecosystems. And agroecosystem is uh, it's based on planned and unplanned diversity. It's spatial and temporal arrangement of domesticated plants and animals in an ecosystem. So this is basically saying, I have a natural system. I've got oaks and I have some things that are actually going to produce food for me. Now I'm going to tuck some things in there. I'm going to tuck some plants and things in there that are good for me and beneficial for me that are going to give me food. 
Sometimes you heard it as integrated forest gardening, native plant and agriculture, forest garden, edible forests. We're just going to go with good old food forest because I think that's the most appropriate term. Why do a food forest? Well, it's a diverse plant and edible plants that attempts to mimic an ecosystem and patterns in nature. Well, why do we want to do that? It helps with pest management, fertilization, weed suppression, pollination, nitrogen fixation, water retention, carbon sequestration, climate stabilization, all the big bad problems that we have right now by just growing plants in, an, in, a, in a cooperative way, we can help do that. No fertilizer, no pesticides. We can just do it with the things that we're gonna put in there. So working with the elements of the ecosystem, that diversity of hypothesis, Diversity hypothesis is a v ecological way of thinking, uh, a theory that basically said the more diverse, the more things that you have in an ecosystem, the more resilient it is, the more stable it is. And we see that in ecology where um, you have a meadow and you have all kinds of different plants and you have one, you know, a bunch of pollinator plants. Well, let's say one of those pollinator plants gets a disease and dies. We have a whole bunch of other pollinator sources, therefore your system's not going to collapse. You have enough different things built in there to sustain the life that's dependent on it should you lose one thing. So when the Pamunkey told the English, no, we're not going to grow fields of corn, they knew what they're thinking about because fields of corn die, you got nothing. But if I have pot, if I have food all over my landscape, then I have diversity and I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be resilient. So um, anybody heard of masting? So masting is a really good example of, um, so one of the reasons, you know, we talked about this uh, is these perturbations, these things that come along. Well, masting is the synchronized occurrence of large amounts of fruits and seeds at irregular levels. Oak trees will do acorns, will do, but they won't do it every year. Every couple of years, they'll just be masses of acorns. And then the next year, the hickories will go nuts. And then, you know, another year, another tree will go nuts. They won't all do it at one time. And that's a strategy. It takes a lot of energy for one thing, so they can't do that. But there's a lot of strategy um, in terms of being able to to take, you know, to reproduce. And it also has a lot to do with weather, resource availability, and oaks and hickories. So we have the emerald ash borer. So one of the big concerns when the emerald ash borer came along was we knew that oaks and hickories are irregular mast. Uh, ashes pretty much put out the same food. So we didn't really worry when there was not a lot of oak and hickory, when the ash, but we knew the ash was gonna be there. What really got ecologists worried was what happens when the ashes are gone? Because that was a reliable food source, feed source. So uh, it's, um, so here's the thing we want to incorporate diverse elements. Uh, each should provide multiple functions. So what we're gonna be talking about are plant selections and your plant selections should serve at least two functions. We'll talk about what that means. Uh, should be a reduction of competition. You want to get rid of the invasives. You're going to go for increased productivity and yield. There should be a functional interconnection. Why are these plants, the different plants that choose? Uh, it has to be stability and resilience. We're looking for reduced herbivory, planting the things that we plant so stuff isn't eating it. And then finally, we want beauty. It's our landscape. So we're going to try to figure out how to do all of that. Here's the building blocks. You can have... Um, you can, you know, the building blocks are pretty much the, the living and the non-living things. Here we have, you might have a lawn. That's your building block. That's your pallet. That's what you're going to begin with. You might get lucky. Um, you know, that's your, that's the thing you have to work with. And then you have the trees and the plants. Those are the things, those are the living things that you're going to use. There's a compositional diversity. And basically that means you want a bunch of different stuff. You know, you want, you want to try to get a lot of different things in your in there. And that that goes all the way from the living things, like the to the plants that we put, the, the kind of soil that we have. You're going to want to put, uh, you're going to want rocks and trees and rotting things in your landscape because they all serve a function. They're all putting stuff. They're all putting things into that system. They're all, um, you want, they're all interacting together. So let's talk about the living organisms. So you want to generate functional interconnections. What's that mean? Well, you want your different things that you're trying to be, the trees and the bushes and the shrubs, you're wanting them to work together. A really good example of that is a plant with a nitrogen fixing bacteria. You want something, you want something in that soil that's pumping out nitrogen because then that's going to give you a healthy plant. Plant with fungi, same thing, that mycorrhizal function, that, that soil health. That's oftentimes the things really missed 
And probably any of the sessions you've heard today, if you want healthy plants, you've got to have healthy soil. Number one, that you've got to have healthy soil. And it's because it's that biome, that microbiome that's in the soil. You want a taxonomic diversity. What's that mean? Um, you want different kingdoms and um, kingdoms and orders of plants. What happens often, like um, certain same orders and same families and same species of families also often share same diseases and same pests. I love roses. Guess what else loves roses? Japanese beetles. Yeah. So don't have a whole bunch of roses. Plant a difference of things. So when the Japanese beetles come along and whatever, you know, the whatever prunus was pumping out berries that you were going to eat from your prunus species. Okay, the Japanese beetles got it, but I have this other thing. I have this elderberry, this other thing that I planted. So be real careful about um, want again diversity. And yeah, it's a perfect example. It's a practical application um, to why you want to have diversity in your landscape. So there's non-living. This is really the part that often gets missed. And I know today all the speakers have talked about the importance of the soil. You want organic debris. You want rich and varied organic debris because then that is going to bring in different microbiome, microorganisms. They're going to break down that soil. There's going to be then the worms and the other bugs and all the things, the building blocks of that ecosystem are all going to come along because you have developed a really um, unique um, and diverse habitat. Mulch, I don't know, just mulch. If nothing else, if you, you know, you could look at your problem, oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to dig this up and plow it up. If you can't do, even if you can't do that, it's just time and effort, just mulch. Just, you know, mulch is an, is an answer to so many things. If you have a grassy area that you want to convert to something, but you don't want to spend the time dig it up to start mulching it, that will go the longest way in really kind of improving that soil health. Because then when you start spending money on plants, then you have a good place to put it. And there's all these reasons. We bear eliminates erosion, soil structure, slow release fertilizer. It, uh, it could work. Okay. Um, so let's get started. As I said, I'm not going to go through an exhaustive list of every forage plant out there. You will zone out. Um, and there's no real need to, because really what I want you to do is to create a space on your property of which to bring in for to bring foods, edible foods. And first thing, go out and get this book. Peterson's Edible Wild Plant Book. There's other ones out there. I love this. And and. Once you understand what kind of, you might have a wet system, you might have a dry system. Once you kind of understand the kind of system you have, then you can start looking at all the plants that are available that you can plant. But you got to have a plant place to put them. You can also start going out and foraging. That's fine, too. This is a great book. Um, identification, identification, identification when it comes to foraging. So um, when my class is what I will actually teach, and Nancy Beers, I hope she doesn't hear me. I'm an invasive or I'm a big fan for the invasive plants because they're the ones everybody knows. Everybody knows what a dandelion looks like. You know, everybody knows what garlic mustard looks like. Some, some of the most edible plants that we have are the invasive species. I'm not allowed to utter them, but she's not around, so I'm going to do that. Um, and then the next thing is then you go, okay, well, I have, so let's say I have some woodlands. Right here, I got some woods, but it's kind of weedy and there's some invasive species in that are not edible. Um, I'm going to go and I'm going to clean that out and then I'm going to actually plant some edible plants in there. And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about plants that you can put in there. Or this is what I got. I got a lawn. So this, okay, it's probably a little bit ready to go more so than this. So this, you're going to, after you've done your assessment, you know what's kind of going on in this area. I'm going to mulch. I'm going to take this corner. I'm going to mulch it. So this is called adaptive. This is basically taking advantage of what you already kind of have, the building block. And this is just blank slate. So we're going to think about types. Um, in terms of diversity, you have to have structure. So um, we have what we call canopy trees. The interesting thing about this, why it is so important to have diversity in the growth types. So there's canopy, mid-story, sometimes called subcanopy, understory, ground cover. The reason that you want diversity is because it also supports different birds. So, and you want birds in your property. You want a diversity of birds in your property because they're going to help your folks and the pests that are eating your plants. So you want that diversity, just that structural diversity. We're not even talking about what kind of canopy tree. Just having that structure in your landscape is going to provide the habitat for those. And then we're going to get into 
what kind of plants we're going to grow in these various layers, but just making sure that you have that structure. And then, of course, there's types of plants, trees, shrubs, herbs, climbers, creepers. Those are just sort of, again, um, sort of growth forms. Now, this, um, so we're going to go a little deeper now in terms of the classic ecological canopy, subcanopy, shrub, and all that thing. And we're going to now start talking about a little bit of functionality. And this is where food forestry starts coming in. So we have a canopy. Canopy, you know, we're going to do the understory. We're going to have some shrubs. And then we're going to have some sort of herb. And then we're going to have a root. Why a root? Well, roots, just by the very nature of their growth, get in there, they tear up the soil, they apply, they make the soil more friable. They bring nutrients deep down, they bring them up to the surface. We're going to have a ground cover. We're going to have a ground cover for erosion control. And then we're going to have vine because the vining thing also provides structure for the birds and the different things. So a little bit deeper in terms of, now we're going to start thinking about what is this going to do for me? Or, of course, we're going to do something called, we're going to build things called guilds. A guild is, you know, there are humans, we have guilds. We have plumber guilds and electrician guilds, and it means a group of people with a similar interest and function. Oops, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the one first supporter, you want that nitrogen fixer. That's the soil. That's the microbe. That's the, you want a healthy, before you have anything else, you want a healthy soil you want a big you want a good space to begin with then we're going to um, mulch we have that surf we have that safe that good soil now we're going to preserve it we're going to keep it we're going to enhance it we're going to do that with mulch mul uh, mul different lowland mulches then third support of the nutrient catchers those are those rooting things they're going to go down there they're going to dig up they're going to bring up the minerals and then finally, the insect detractors, we want pollination, we don't want decomposition. If we have a bunch of different bugs, they're going to help with the other pests that we get. Now let's, um, so when I teach foraging, there are basically three seasons. Uh, I call spring the leafy green season. Okay, so dandelion is not a native, okay? But it is my favorite plant. In terms of foraging, Dandelion is probably one of the most useful plants there is out there. You can eat the flowers, you can eat the stems, you can eat the greens, you can eat the roots. Every bit of it is edible. Different times it's more palatable than others. It's an amazing plant. The root, I make a root coffee. Also for medicinal, it is one that is actually has proven healthy benefit. It is really amazing for that liver function. So when the dandelion, it is the most maligned plant. We spend billions of dollars trying to get rid of it. It is probably one of the most healthy, useful plants that we have in our landscape. So from a foraging perspective, dandelion's not native, but it's staying on the list. There's spring beauties, violets, milkweed. Why do we not, you know, why does nobody eat the monarch butterfly? Oh, it's milkweed's poisonous. It is if you don't cook it. But when the shoots start coming up, you can blanch them, you can eat the shoots. The, when the flowers come, I make a vinegar or I make a cordial out of the out of the flowers. The pods, the pods are delicious. You blanch the pods, they taste like okra, fried okra. It's delicious. It's one of those plants that, oh, it's poisonous. We don't need it. Well, no, we did eat it. We've eaten it a long time. It's a wonderful vegetable. Um, there's mints, so mints for making tea. They're you know, they they're um, ostrich fern, fiddlehead fern comes from the ostrich fern. Broadleaf cattail. Cattail is another just astounding plant. So, well, I don't have a picture of one, but so everybody's familiar with the cattail. You know, grows, gets the gets the, the corn cobby looking thing on top. Well, basically, what it does is it gets two corn cobby things on top. First one in the early spring, it'll get the male flower. And if you catch the male flower when it's pollen laden, you take the male flower off, put it in a bag, shake it up. You have that pollen. It's packed with protein, so you add it to flower. Or the female, when it first starts coming up, still wrapped in the sheath, take it off, blanch it, eat it like corn in the cob. Work your way on down the stem, pull it up, open it up. In the pith, there's a pith. It's almost like um, hearts of palm, tastes like cucumber. I make a capri salad out of it. Keep on digging, dig up the root and the corn. Now you have a starchy vegetable. It's a astounding plant. Uh, I do not recommend going out and pulling this out of your stormwater pond uh because they are bioaccumulators so that means that they are going to take up whatever they're growing in so if you're going to eat cattail or just come join one of my classes and i'll do it properly um 
So yeah, there's the uh, so that's Spring Beauty violets, uh, pillowhead, milkweed, greenbrier. Greenbrier is one of the most obnoxious weeds. I mean, it's a vine and it's got neat stickers on it. But those little tips of growing tips, uh, take them off. It tastes like fresh asparagus. Just delicious. Spring green. In the summertime, we get to the fruits and vegetables section. And all kinds of, there's all kinds of fruits out there. All of these are native. Cerveberry, huckleberry. Um, that's a viburnum. Sumac, sumac's one of my favorites. This is, makes a it delicious, it's a gorgeous landscape plant. You can take these berries, make a lemonade out of them. Lovely, lovely, uh, lovely drink. Here's the milkweed pods. Here's our cattail. That's the male, that's the female. They're well past their edible state, but um, the uh, pawpaw. Who's had pawpaw? Oh, pawpaw is wonderful. It's the unicorn. The forage plants, you know, it tastes like banana custard. It's so strange, the tropical fruit. Very strange, but just an absolute delight. And then we get into fall, the nuts, roots, and tuber season. Oaks and hickories. Uh, I love oaks. I'll make an acorn, uh, an acorn flower. Acorns and nuts were vital to people because it was a source of fat. So it was one thing that you could dry it, you could grind it up, you could turn it into a flour, but it was a source of fat because fat was going to get you through the winter. You might run out of meat, but at least you had the source of fat that you could. So I'll make an acorn flour and I'll mix the acorn flour with regular flour. So I've taken my kind of inert regular flour and I've now added this nutrient rich acorn flour to it. And so I've actually made this kind of you know healthy bread. Um, hickory nuts. Hickory nuts are kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of tribes, I don't know if you've ever tried to eat a hickory, it's a frustrating experience because they don't, you know, like a walnut will crack open and the fruit and the nut comes out real easy. Hickory nut doesn't do that. So what natives do is they just gather them and they pound them. They just mix, they just smash shell all together and they have little balls of it. And then you'll put it in hot water. All the oils and the meats will separate. Shells will sink to the bottom. You pour it off. You can drink it. Just, they call it hickory nut milk. There is um, there's a Cherokees make a soup out of it. So it's really a, a very useful, but it's that fat. They're trying to get that fat out of it. Solomon seal. Um, oh, so the reason that roots were so important was because it was something that would store. You didn't have refrigeration, but it was something you could put in your cellar. And so Solomon seal is a beautiful ornamental plant. Really gorgeous, spreads like crazy. This one right here. Burdock, okay. Um, you know, burdock, the thing with the things that stick to your clothes when you walk through the field with the big leaves and the stickers that stick to your clothes and your dog's fur. This root, delicious, absolutely delicious. Non native, so Nancy Beers, I'm sorry, but um, it is a non native, but it is just one of those foods that I'm not going to pass up. Those roots can get two to three feet long. So it's tearing up the soil, it's breaking up the soil, it's bringing up all those nutrients that are dug down deep. So I can, I'll chop that off. I will, I'll use those leaves as mulch. I'll let them break down because they have all these nutrients that they've pulled up from the soil. I eat this, the microbes eat that. And I have, I've created this, this input to my garden. Walnuts, walnuts are another um, wonderful. When I was growing up, there used to be these portable hullers. So people would go out and they would gather walnuts. They would fill the back of their pickup trucks with them. And that was Christmas money or shoe money. People would go out and they would gather walnuts. You ever seen anybody gather walnuts? No. And the huller, well, but the hullers, the hullers aren't around. Nobody does this anymore. So, it, you know, it was, it was this additional income source that, that um, people had available to them. Medicinal, so here's my thoughts on herbal medicinals. Um, I studied Native American and every tribe, I can pick one plant and every tribe is gonna have a different use for yarrow. You know, so I, I, I kind of give it, <laughs> I kind of, I, a grain of salt. They do, they do have medicinal properties, but which one is the right one? I don't know. Do your homeopathy, do your herbal medicine, kind of delve into that, but provide a space because the thing that also all of these do is they're also amazing pollinators. So yeah, bring them on into your property. Yarrow, bee balm, uh, Carolina rose, uh, Joe pie weed, 
Bowen set, um, Joe Pye weed. Actually comes from a famous Native American medicinal man called Joe Pye. Joe Pye. Somebody, you know, so somebody did, somebody tried to pop quiz me today, and I had the answer to that. Harry Glasgow tried to, what were Joe Pye? And I, and I, the look on his face, and I told him why it's kind of comical. But um, yeah, this plant right here, and he used this plant a lot in his medicine. But again, beautiful things, bring them in. They're gorgeous plants that grow really well, and um, and they also sort of function. So we're going to start preparing your site. Get a soil test. Cooperative Extension Service, ten bucks. They're going to do a soil test. They're going to tell you about your soil. And they're going to tell you uh, either you're going to be fine with what it is and you're going to work with what it is, or you might have to supplement it. Um, but uh, that's the first. And, and take that time, build a solid foundation before you go out and buy a whole bunch of expensive plants. Make sure that you're putting them in a good space. Site conditions. Also got to tell you, are you dealing with suburban lot? Suburban lot, what they've done is they've torn off all the topsoil. If you're living in a subdivision, the topsoil is gone. So you have to recreate that soil. If you're in an old agricultural field, that'll have its own issues. If you're in a forest, that's going to have its own issues. So do that soil test to kind of understand what you're working with. And there's all kinds of site technique. Yeah, and like you said, whether it's either the adaptive side or the whole just, I'm going to start from scratch. But it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take money. It's going to take patience. But if you make sure that that soil and that site is ready to go, then it's going to be well worth the time and the effort and the money that you're going to put into it. So in terms of plant selection, there are tons of native plants out there. And I just thought, OK, we're going to do an experiment. So we're going to go through and we're going to actually create a food forest using edible plants. But instead of like coming up with every single one, I said, I'm, what I'm going to do is plant Nova natives has an edible native plants list. And I'm like, okay, because what I do is I created guilds. I'm going to use strictly use the plants from that plant list. And um, so plant over natives, um, edible native plants, this is what their list looks like. And it gives you the scientific name, common name, the role, height, width, sun, moisture. Uh, the shade tree, understory tree, Ground cover. Remember, we talked about having those layers. This tells you where it is. It's going to give you the size. So, oh, that's a canopy tree. And, oh, that's a shrub. Um, so there's a lot of, oh, this is the site conditions that I have. There's a ton of information just in that list alone. And it is not exhaustive in terms of all the native plants. So this is the list I worked with. And so I said, okay, let's make some gilts just from that list. I could put other things in there, but I said, well, can I just use this list? So we're going to do a walnut guild. We're going to do walnuts because walnuts are a wonderful source of, of meat, of nuts. Um, so that's going to be our canopy tree. It's going to get big. Now, walnuts have an obnoxious habit of not wanting neighbors. It's called a lelopathy. Their kind of a lelopathy, though, is instead of putting down a toxic, is they will actually take up all the nutrients. So certain plants can't compete against it. One plant is. Mulberry. Mulberry makes a lovely, delicious, juicy fruit. I find their sweetness a little cloying. My kids love them, but anyway. So we're going to plant mulberry. Next to our black walnut, we're going to plant mulberry or mulberries. Now we need a shrub. Let's do flower and raspberry. It's going to get a fruit. It's a beautiful plant, too. It's real pretty. Birds are going to love it. You're going to, you and the birds are going to be chasing each other to try to get fruit off of it. Okay, now we need an herb. Wild bergamot. This is a medicinal, or you can just make a very pleasant tea. Butterflies love it. Remember, two functions. We're going for a food and something either. It's got to serve several different functions. Jerusalem artichoke choke for our, uh, for our root. Again, big old, beautiful plant. You get one artichoke, you plant one artichoke, you're going to have 10 the next year. You're going to have 100 the next year. So it's one of those plants that's just pumping it out. But in the meantime, it's breaking up the soil and making it very malleable. And we need a ground cover. So let's go with fragrant sumac. I love sumac. Like I said, the, the tea or the berries, good for the birds, good for you. And passion flower vine. Uh, I could not find a picture of that, but it gets, a, it gets a lovely fruit on it. And so we have a vine. So that's how you create a guild. Every single thing has at least two functions up there. Every single thing's creating a food for me or for the wildlife. It's also serving the ecosystem. <laughs> All right, let's try 
I got a wet spot in my yard. Okay, well, let's do for our canopy tree, let's do persimmon. Anybody had a persimmon? Okay. Did, did you have a good persimmon or did you have a bad persimmon? Because the joke, the joke is, oh, persimmon, that sounds delicious. It takes like a really hard killing frost to make them remotely palatable. The fun joke is, oh, here, try this. It, it'll suck the moisture out of your mouth. It's it's terrible, but it's it's a fun joke. The botany, you know, botany joke. And there we have the pawpaw as our understory tree. This is probably going to create some shade. So in the shade, we're going to do some pawpaw. And food for us, food for the birds, food for is it the swallowtail butterfly. Yeah, the swallowtail butterfly. This is the larval host for it. Then we are going to do spice bush. The spice, uh, you can see these little berries. The birds love the berries. You can make a nutmeg substitute for it. Spice bush, aptly named. Bee balm, here we have our herb. Butterflies, makes a lovely tea. For uh, ground nut, this is, this is not real. It, it grows around here. This is one that it's a member of the bean. It's a, it is a truly a legume. It'll get a tuber on it. It has the same nitrogen fixing qualities about it. Also, uh, birds love it. Here's our, we're going to combine both our herb layer and our ground cover. We're going to do ostrich fern. As you see, it will spread. And the springtime comes up. These are going to be your fiddlehead ferns. Okay, let's try one more. Now, I've got small areas. I don't have a place for an oak tree or a walnut tree. Okay, well, let's scale it down a little bit. Let's... Um, now, if we looked at that list, downy service berry is probably going to be a shade or a canopy tree. Okay, but this is the space that you can you can still recreate. You can still kind of create that structure. You can kind of get that one tree that's sort of um, this gets lovely, uh, you know, tasty berries that grows on it. And then for our understory, we're going to do smooth sumac, both for just the the fruits for us, the fruits for the birds. Beautiful plant. Fall color, nothing beats it. Elderberry, um, you know, elderberry, you ha you have to eat, you have to cook elderberry. You know that? Just make sure if you get elderberry, um, it's all the rage right now in homeopathic medicine. I make a shrub and a vinegar out of it. I just like the taste of it. And so we're going to, for our herb, we're going to do our, our mountain mint. I'm sorry, I didn't put a label on that. And then for our ground cover, we're going to have our wild strawberry. We do do not confuse this with the little Duquesne indica. There's another thing that looks like a strawberry, and you think it is, and it doesn't taste anything like a strawberry. They call them Indian strawberries, um, but we do have a native strawberry, delicious. And then uh, and then passion flower again um, for another for a vine. We're kind of limited in the vines, at least just working from that list. The invasives, close the door. Um, these are some of my favorites, um, Nancy. Yeah, and you're not going to have to plant them because they're going to pop up. They are going to the minute you start making one of these or several of these are going to show up. This guy's going on right now. Harry Bittercrest, most unfortunate name for a plant. You know, who, and it's neither hairy nor bitter. Um, it's actually, it is a crest. It's a land crest. If you, if you go out, if you got mulch somewhere, you're going to see this little round, little green rosette. And it's this. Take a bite of it. It's going to taste. It's going to have that lovely pequin, peppery quality that a crest has. I make a pesto out of it. And it's fresh and it's green. And right this time of year, it's just, it tastes, it just tastes healthy. Uh, the next one, this is also... Um, this is in your yard right now, and you will, it's one of those you tends to, you tend to not notice it until you key in on it because it's kind of skinny and it sort of hides, you don't see it. Uh, field garlic, I will chop off the, the greens, I'll chop them up, I'll put them in a, a container, like a eight ounce or, you know, canning jar, stick them in there, just chop them up, pack them in there, pour olive oil, set it for 48 hours, strain it off, the most delicious flavored oil. If you've ever eaten these things, they're unctuous. My kids think it's a hoot to like eat one and then jump in the car with you. You know, you know, it's horrible. Um, but that flavor is really um is really delicious in oil. Lamb's quarters. This is another one. You, once you've seen it, once somebody points out that this is a delicious uh, spinach substitute. Lovely green, grows like a weed, plenty of it, makes a great spinach substitute. Garlic mustard. This is one of my favorites. 
Garlic mustard is, it is. I mean, it's amazing. So same one, you're going to eat it and you're going to know why they call it garlic mustard because it's going to taste like garlic and then it's going to have that bite like a mustard. Make a pesto out of it. It is unbelievable. It's this rich and savory. Um, in my classes, I will do a charcuterie spread and it'll be like a spread. And I've had chefs tell me, like, this is unbelievable because it's just so tasty and so savory. Daylilies, of course, you can eat the flowers, the ornament, but when you dig up a daylily, you know those orange ones that grow along the side of the road? Or even the ones growing in your yard, they have tubers. Dig them up. I cut off the nippy bits, and it's like a little sweet russet potato. Delicious. Absolutely delicious. A little bit of butter. Wood sorrel. Um, as a kid, it's that lemony, you know, like kind of sour. They call it sour clover. This is delicious. I will take a smoked trout, and I'll make a puree. I'll make a smoked trout spread, and I'll add this to it, and it'll bring out that lemon flow. So you can really do things with these foods. So yeah, this is not most palatable at its normal stage, but you can elevate it and you can make it tasty. And that's kind of the point that I'm doing with foraging is that whole edible versus palatable part. I feel the garlic is yeah, and so that that's a good point with foraging is it's always best to kind of be either absolutely positive that you know what you're doing or or be cautious. Um, yeah, it's okay, I'm going to do that. Okay, so this is information about me. Um, I'll keep this up there. And so this is my email. So if you, I, as I said, I do do trainings and I you know, sometimes I'll just do pop-up classes. So here's my email. I'll put you on an email list that I have. So every month when I'm doing different things, I teach at the Salamander Resort. That's over in Middleburg. That's about a two and a half to three hour class. This is kind of the spread that I do. This is sort of a charcuterie style spread. So we try all kinds of different things. We walk around the property. I point out the things and we come back and you eat things because it's only two and a half to three hours. If you want me to come out to your property, then we will do a five or six hour session. We'll walk around your property. We will actually make things. So that's another option. Uh, and I know if Lauberge Provençal is a French country inn over in White Post, Virginia, we're actually doing cooking classes there. And it's world class four diamond restaurant. And so those classes, May 6th, July 22nd, November 4th, that's their phone number. As I said, possibly for private tours. If you're interested also, these are two articles that were done in uh, Middleburg Life. Um, you can, that's an easy subscription. How are we doing on time? Oh, okay. Well, I'm fine. If you all have any questions, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Let, uh, oh, let me just catch her in on it. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. So the question was, it's, um, do I have any pictures of guilds? No, because the guilds that I described were just, I just took, now I have pictures of guilds, but not based upon the plant list that we worked with. And the idea is for you to, is to be familiar and comfortable enough with the plants that you would like to bring into it and to make sure that they're serving those functions. So um, my guild would probably have other plants that weren't on that list, you know, so that's kind of, no, I, I don't, but um, if you think about nature and if you look, look at nature, like a well, if you look at a really healthy ecosystem, yeah, it's all gonna be there. But. That's the goal is to try to get us to be comfortable and confident with our site and what we want, and then making sure that it fits those seven layers. Yes. It is. So um, this Wednesday, February 15th at 6.30, I will be teaching a Native American and Appalachian foodways and foraging. And that'll be at Shepherd University, 6.30. It's also available virtually. And if you go onto the uh, Shepherd University's uh, Center for Appalachian Studies, 
you'll see that program and it'll guide you through the virtual link. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So I started doing the reps of They're all in Right. So you're going to you. So you already have an existing black walnut stand. So you're going to do something adaptive. You already have your canopy. Now, the one thing I would recommend or would ask is what's underneath it. Is it mowed grass, lawn? Okay, so probably nothing or at least grass. So first thing you, okay, first thing to get rid of the grass, mulch it, you know, make it, make, um, first is, is, is make, is make that site a, so that you can plant other things in it. And then you have to find out plants that are knowing that black walnuts and the way they behave. Then you have to research plants that are compatible with black walnuts, mulberry, mulberry is one. There's other ones out there. And then, so that's the next thing is you're thinking about the relationship. Okay, here's this guy that he's not the nicest guy, but there's all these other plants that can coexist with right. him. So then you work them into not like, oh, I, you know, I keep planting this thing here and it keeps dying. Well, yeah, because it definitely can't be there. It doesn't want to be there. So you have to. Yeah, you got to, you know, kind of really think about the relationships that you of the plants to each other. I I would I would get my I would get the site ready first. Yeah, mulch it, start getting the soils ready, figure out what your area, get the soils down and and but get rid of the grass because the grass um the our lawn grass is extremely competitive. Yeah, and you know, and it's and even if you're not doing a food forest, anything that you're putting in your yard, create a create a good space for it because um, but grass is you're just constantly out competing it because it, it you know it's just very aggressive. Passion flower, passion blend. Passion flower, mm -hmm. fragrant sumac. Yeah. You're welcome. So New York, uh, New York City, Central Park. There's this gentleman every weekend, all year long, that does foraging yeah. all over the world. Yeah, there's a tremendous. As long as we get rid of this, oh, it's going to be native. Yeah. There's so many weeds out there that are edible. It's probably the reason why they are here is we bought them. Yeah. Because they're edible. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.